Proverbs chapter number 9. Continuing with wisdom. Wisdom has builded her house. Jesus said, I will prepare a place for you. She has hewed out her seven pillars. Now, wisdom is personified as a woman. For a young man that, that Solomon is writing to his son and children, he's likened to wisdom to a, to a woman that should be desired. More than gold, more than silver. And as we saw in chapter 8, wisdom is Jesus Christ. It is not only an attribute of God, but it is God in the creation act. And builded her house, Matthew 16, 18. He would have seven pillars. Seven in the Bible is complete. Finished. And I don't know if a reference can be here to Isaiah 11, 2. I've got a question mark to that that you can read. The pillars, 1 Timothy 3, 15. Paul writes one time, he says, uh, Peter, James, Cephas who seem to be pillars. There are church offices that hold up. And that's what a pillar is, and there's more than one. There was a pillar in Solomon's time that in the temple he named one Boaz, and I forget the name of the other, that he named these two. Jesus Christ, according to the Corinthians that Paul writes to, he is the only foundation that a man can lay, and upon a foundation you build pillars. One of these days, the church, if I may say, the, the, the shingles are going to go on the roof. Now, at what point are we at the, at the building of the church? I'm using this as an illustration. One day, that church is going to be built as a building, and it's going to be finished. And then once the building is finished, everything's put in there, the windows and, and everything's painted and electrical and the plumbing's all put, then Jesus Christ is going to call us home when we are completed. Ever since the foundation has been laid that there is a building of a church and we're not finished yet. And Jesus Christ is not going to move in and knock at the door until it's completely finished. You don't turn the keys over to the owner until the building is completely finished. And Jesus Christ is the owner. He paid for it with his blood. She has killed her beasts. Sacrificing food. There's a king that Jesus talks about in a parable. He went out and killed his beasts. His oxen. And made ready for his sons for a dinner for his son. And he went out and gathered all the people. The first group of people rejected and turned away, slumbed their noses at it. She has mingled her wine. New wine. Psalms 102, verse 9. It's never a wine that's intoxicating. It may be a wine that is even put in with more fruit juices. Juices, I said. I didn't say intoxication. Water added to it. Jesus made water into wine. And it was well beloved of the people who had the marriage feast. She has also furnished her table. It's a dining, it's a fellowship, it's a meal. She has sent forth her maidens. Again, that parable of the king has sent forth his servants. Well, here she sends women out. The church is the bride of Jesus Christ. She cries upon the highest places of the city. She, wisdom, not the maidens. There's your street preaching again. There is wisdom crying out in the street. Come! Alright. You know, you remember chapter 1. Whoso is simple. Remember the three people? 
the simple, the full, and the, and the scorner. Here we go back to them. Eight chapters later, here we are again. The three people you're going to deal with. <clears throat> the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. You might build a reason with him. I don't know. You could. The scorner, mm, you could, but the simple, he better chances. Let him turn in hither. Come on, you simple. Salvation's simple. As for him that one is understanding, she saith unto him. All right, here's somebody that wants to understand, and he doesn't go to a college, he doesn't go to a cemetery. He doesn't know where to go to. He's got some kind of knowledge of God and believes something he doesn't know. He's got light. John 1 says Christ is the light. So wisdom cries out to the simple one who wants to know something he doesn't know, understand completely. Come eat of my bread. Jesus is the bread of life. Come is an invitation. So somebody who wants understanding, who's not sure, there's an invitation sent to that person. You could never say, what about the heathen that never knew? No, there's an invitation. At whatever point you knowledge God, there's an invitation for more knowledge of God. And it's the point that you look and say, no, that's it. I don't want any more. The invitation has been ripped up. And even after trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior, the invitation is to learn more of the Bible and be able to do what God wants us to do in His will to witness and to help others. To grow from the babe in Christ to Paul the aged. There's an invitation. And that invitation is only canceled by you refusing the light. At whatever point that is. Eat of my bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. John 6, 27. There was bread put out on the show table. The show bread was put out on the table. Six and six. Fresh. And even David had part of that bread, which he wasn't supposed to. The priests were to eat of that bread. The disciples broke bread. And drink of the wine which I have mingled again. And the wine that Jesus Christ referenced to as a symbol of his blood, Acts 20:28, 20, it's the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is God. What do you see in Proverbs chapter 9, verse 5? You see the Lord's Supper. There's the bread and there's the wine. You are invited to the upper room of the Lord Jesus Christ and after the resurrection of the body and blood, the gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins was buried and rose again. There it is right there. Wisdom sat at that last table, that last meal. Wisdom is to be set forth when your church does the communion or the Lord's Supper. You are to know what Christ has done for you, and you are to know that Christ is coming for you. That's wisdom. Forsake the foolish. There's a foolish guy. Come on, stop being stupid. Stop saying there's a there's no God. Stop saying you worship Satan. Stop it. Forsake it. And live. As long as a man is foolish, he's not going to have eternal life. It's the Bible. So fools die and go to hell. So excuse me. I'm not saying that tongue in cheek. If you reject Jesus Christ as your Savior, I call you a fool. I call you a loser too. 
A loser that you're not going to get eternal life. You're going to lose it. For a born-again Christian, you're a loser if you lose rewards. You're a loser. I got a sound Bible doctrine to call you a loser or call you a fool. And go in the way of understanding. Well, there's we just read that someone is seeking understanding. Verse 4, now go in the way of it. All right, here's some understanding. Walk in it. And you'll get more. Listen, my personal life, when I grew up as a child, I, was, I grew up in a Roman Catholic church. I grew up with, with my belief. What God has laid on my heart, there was a God. Thank God I wasn't into that Mary stuff. Okay? I was not into that. I was not into the candles. I did not go into confessional or anything like that. I grew up that there's a God and I believe that. And God put some things in my life, in my childhood, said, what are, you, what are you going to do? I ran to the Catholic Church. I ran to the altar. I ran on my knees and prayed to that God. I had somebody read to me. I read the Bible, something like uh, uh, when Christ was born, there was a star. Every Christmas at midnight, from where, however I woke up, set the alarm clock, I would look up in the sky. And I would look for that. Star. That's what someone told me. They told me Christ was born on Christmas, and they told me there was a star. I would look for that star. That was a light. I mean, you say how foolish it was, but that light brought me to April 14, 1987, where I knelt down at 773 Broad Street in Waterford, Connecticut, at my grandma's table, knelt down with Joe Caswell, who led me to the Lord Jesus Christ, and asked Jesus to save my soul. And I rode on there. To, I went into uh, the Good News Bible. The pastor told me we have visitation, tell people about Jesus Christ. There was gospel tracts to pass out to people, not to keep. And there was telling people about Jesus. And there was Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night, midweek service. I would go. And each day I kept walking in that understanding. And here I am today. I'm able to sit down with an open Bible and somehow, sometimes show people the way. And I may get spoofed. I may have to say I don't know. Now, what if as a little boy, I would say, well, yeah, there's God, but then there's Mary, the religion I was in. I may not be where I am today. I may be a Mary worshiper, or could have. I could have been out there cleaning her on the, on the half shell. A lot of people go into a church and they say, okay, I believe that. And fall into apostasy, fall into deception, fall into the ways of Satan. Because I don't want to believe that. I always believed there was a God and I always believed that Jesus Christ. Even though I didn't know who Jesus really was. And when I would look upon at the Catholic Church, I remember I would look upon him, upon that cross. And every Easter they say he would roll from the grave. And I look up there like, well, what's he still doing on the cross? Did God answer my question or not? Now, for some, there are people out there, they want to keep Christ on the cross. Okay, God said, okay, fine. That's where you want my son? That's where I want your son. That's it. You get no more light. So you got to realize, when you're dealing with a, with a religious person, and I don't say Roman Catholic, because I grew up that I had family that dedicated, die-hard Roman Catholics. And you witness to them, and they're... They've had the truth. They know Jesus is virgin born. They know the story of his birth. They know about him dying on the cross. They know about the empty tomb. But they choose to whatever part of their religion over what God says. That is their choice. And you may be dealing with what God has told you to go ye in all the world and preach the gospel. But to the person you're witnessing to, that's my aunt, that's my sister, that's my father. That may be a total stranger. That may be my boss. But I'm told to go in all the world. And God said, that's what you're supposed to do. But for them, their life is closed. They rejected me a long time ago. And Jeremiah had that with the nation of Israel. There was a point that God told Jeremiah, don't pray for them. Can you imagine God saying that? Because they have well rejected me. Where is that rejection of the people?
They got light, they got wisdom, and they turned it off. And we see it in the simpleton, we see it in the fool, or he that reproveth a scorner. See, a fool will take the light and turn from it. Now here's a scorner. Reprove not a scorner, least he hate thee. If you were to come down to the farmer's market, you will see a lot of people that hate us because we are reproving them about sin. They make the Bible right. Well, it says, reprove not a scorner. Well, I'm told to go all the wrong and preach the gospel. That's an individual. If you're dealing with somebody and they're, re they're reproving you, reproving you, re stop the conversation, say, okay, let's have a good day. Can I give you a gospel track for later on? Don't spend all day with him because he's only going to hate you more. And it's sorry because that may be a family member. And the more you deal with them, the more they may just hate you. And you you got to have that cutting off. And say, you know what? I've done my best. You are in the hands of the Lord, and you say that between you and the Lord, and that's it. But a scorner, the more you try to help him, the more he's going to hate you. That's a Bible fact right there. As much as you love him, rebuke a wise man who is the opposite. We're starting to get into opposites now. We're starting to get in that proverb. The opposites, yay! Yay! Rebuke, rebuke a wise man and he will love thee. That is complete opposite of a scorner. What is a scorner? He is not a wise man. When that, when that, I don't even remember who it was. When that, when that brother in the Lord came up to me, he says, Brother Stiley, what are you doing with those tracks? He says, I'm trying to get all the see this one's number 587. I haven't got, I Brother, hey, what are you doing? I'm collecting these Christian comic books. And what are you doing with them? Well, one day they'll be worth money or so. I don't know. I'm just collecting them. Brother Hayward, you need to give those to lost people. What do you mean? These are gospel tracts, and they're used to hand to people who don't know about Jesus so they can... Oh! Okay. Well, I thought they were just for Christians. No, there are, and you know, he told me there are all kinds of tracks out there for all kinds of things. Thank God for that brother, and I hope he gets a good crown in heaven, because ever since that day, I have been associated with tracks. You know what? I wasn't a scorner. I was a wise man. I love that. I don't even remember who the guy was. I love him. No, I could have been a scorner. Well, who do you think you are? I'm just, you know, I'm no better than you. I could hate the guy and be a fool and made the Lord who never brought me where I am with the gospel track ministry. Listen, I'm going far and above through the Lord supporting the fellowship track league. I'm getting more tracks out credit to me than I can even think about getting out. Why? Because I was wise one day and loved the person that, that rebuked me. And there are some Christians out there that, yeah, they need to, they need to be rebuked until, you know, what is the right way. And you, I don't think you had any malicious intent in doing it. And look what he'd done. I was saved in 1987, and this is 2014. How many years of correction that I have done for that guy? And you know what? You know what the Lord may do? Every gospel track I get out may be accounted to him. How about that? You know, there was a time when the Postal Service, they had, the stamps were cheap. I was mailing out every week 20 letters of salvation with tracks in them. That guy may be credited to all that. And you know what? You know how you find out who a Christian is? If he hates you, he's a scorner. If he loves you, he's wise. How about that? 
Now, don't make it your mission in life, your superhero ability to go around and tell Christians what to do. Oh, don't you do that. You let God guide you and direct you in that. And you better pray over it and pray over it and pray over it and pray over it and pray over it before you open up your big fat mouth. Which that's a whole different study. All right, verse 8, I have 2 Timothy 4, 2. Give instruction to a wise man with chapter, with verse 8, and he will yet he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. Guess what the Bible says I was? I was, the Bible says, a wise man. I became wiser, and I was a just man, and I increased in learning. I can mention tons of Christians who are born again saved and they're spiritually retarded because they haven't grown. They haven't seeked the understanding of God. They are content where they are. That's wrong. That's another word that I can use as far as loser and as a fool is spiritually retarded. means you have not developed fully into a Christian. Exodus 31 3, 35 31, Isaiah 11 2, Colossians 1 19, Proverbs 2 10, 9 10, and 19 6 on that verse. See, as a Christian, the, the potential for you to grow doesn't stop until the Lord takes you home. You are absent from the body and present with the Lord. And then, even then, when you get to glory, do you know how much you're going to learn? Do you know if you were to die right now as a born-again Christian, you see the Lord Jesus. What a step in movement. Now you've seen the one you believe in. But guess what? You go up there and if your grandma's there or your grandpa's up there or you, your wife is up there or you got a child up there, you say, Hi, loved one. How you doing? Oh, I'm so glad you're here. Hey, well, what does New Jerusalem look like? Don't know. Haven't seen it yet. Yeah, but Revelation says there's New Jerusalem. Yeah, but Revelation says it comes out of heaven. It's not here yet. Well, what's it what's it like when, when Satan's cast out of here? That hasn't happened. That's in Revelation 12. You realize even if you were to die and go to heaven right now, you still will not get the full potential yet until, until all the time goes by? Wouldn't it be great if in eternity we are forever learning about the Lord Jesus Christ? John says that if you were to write everything that Jesus done, it would take, you couldn't comprehend the, the writings of Jesus Christ. What if we just spent all eternity about all those writings that could have been written? A Catholic would hate it because we're not going to get married no time. Islam would hate it because we wouldn't get Buddha and Allah the time. The fear of the Lord, chapter 1. We'll go back there, chapter 1. Let's read you real quick. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Now look at this one. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Oh, that must be a typo. Throw no. The fear of the Lord will eventually get you wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. You know, when I got saved in 1987, I knew I wasn't going to go to hell. You know what I know today that I didn't know back then? Ask me about the rapture church back then. There was no Hollywood movies. I wouldn't be able to tell you anything about the rapture, or even what the rapture was about. And I would go to the concordance, look up the word rapture, and find it's not even in the Bible. So I wouldn't be able to tell you nothing. Today I can. I can open to the passage in the Bible and show you where it is. If I figure out if it's first Thessalonians or second Thessalonians, I have a problem with the first and second books. Getting over that little loophole, I can show you where it is in the Bible. It was a time I probably couldn't find Exodus. Didn't even know what Exodus meant.
and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. You go to Proverbs chapter 31, there's a guy there that says, I had no knowledge of the holy. You know what the knowledge of the holy is? It's everything about God. And still more to learn. I can semi describe the, the Trinity, but can't do it to its fullest. I have the holy. I know what God hates. Go somewhere this week, somewhere, mall, uh, grocery store, car wash, anywhere. Just pick anywhere, take a dart and throw it in your neighborhood map and find where, the, and say, pick 100 people at random. All ages, all sizes, all shapes, all male, female, any race or anything like that. And say, does God hate? And see what kind of answers you get. Now I can tell you, I can open the Bible and show you where God does hate. That's the knowledge of the Holy. The Holy God hates. Now some people want to think hate is holy. I do. I think some things that hate is a righteous move. For by me, wisdom, thy days shall be multiplied. I am going to call you a fool. And I'm going to call you a loser if you drink or smoke. Because even the Surgeon General tells you your life expectantly, your life expectantly is cut off. Your vital organs are being ruined. You are, according to the Bible, you are a loser. Because you cut off your life. And I believe, and I'm marking a place in the Bible where, where you can die before your time. And that would be a sin. If God has a set date for you, and you, you destroy your life beforehand... It would be a sin. And the years of thy life shall be increased if you do what wisdom tells you to do. Wisdom does not tell you to put something to your lips that does not belong to your lips. Matter of fact, the first time you've done it, wisdom would tell you no. And then when you started throwing up and got sick over it, that's wisdom telling you, better not do it again. But you were a fool and didn't listen. I was a fool and didn't listen. I remember when I first smoked a cigarette and you get sick afterwards. I got on a school bus from New London, Connecticut all the way to Grassel Tech. I was sick on that entire bus trip trying not to throw up. When you got to take a 30, 35 minute bus ride with, with red lights and stuff like that and jumping on a highway going 55 miles per hour and you, I mean you're just pale green. And you know what? I was stupid. I kept it up. How stupid we do. But by me, thy days may be multiplied and the years of thy life may be increased. In the New Testament, your life may be cut off by being martyred. You know, Paul's life was cut off, he was martyred. You know, outside the fact that if Paul wasn't martyred, how long would he have lived for the Lord? And how many more souls? But the government cut him off. How far was John the Baptist gone? And Jesus said he was the best of all the male children ever born. You know, the Bible is silent about what he did in the jail. You think maybe he witnessed you think he had an ultimate jail ministry? I don't know. If thou be wise, okay? If. You don't have to be wise. You can be stupid. Thou shalt be wise for thyself. 
Don't go bragging. Look at the, look at the letters after my name. Listen, I just dropped that stuff off my Facebook page. It didn't mean nothing. Yeah, I got the degrees and I got the diplomas. It's between me and God. You don't have to go out there and hey everybody, look what I know from the Bible. They probably know just as much as you need to know. Any uh but if thou scornest Thou alone shalt bear it. Galatians 6 7. Be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth that he shall also reap. The opposite of a wise man is a scorner. So when somebody's scorning you because you're talking about Jesus Christ, you're witnessing all that, you just mark in, in, in your little pea brain and don't you get high and mighty about it. You're wise and they're foolish. In the eyes of God. God is pleased with what you are doing, and he is not pleased with what the person is doing. That's to keep you going. That's to keep you alive. That's to keep you to do what God wants you to do. That's not for you to brag and get boastful and pride and big-headed. Now, we did the wise woman. Everything about God. Now we're going to do a contrast. What's the opposite of wise? Fool. So a foolish woman is clamorous. Means she's loud, Job 2.10. She won't shut up. Wisdom must be quiet and virtuous. Speak only when spoken to. You know the Bible says that Paul, uh, yeah, that Paul writes. I believe it's Timothy. The women are keep silent in the churches. You know, a woman that stands in the pulpit, a woman that, that directs the church meetings and stuff like that. She is not a wise woman. She's a foolish woman. So your women preachers, your women television, whatever you want to call them, and radio, whatever you want to call it, those women are foolish. They have violated the word. She is simple. Well, that's the ones we witness to. According to Proverbs 1, not even saved. Or never grew if saved. Spiritually retard. And knoweth nothing. Proverbs 31. 10 to 31 and 1 Corinthians 14 34 and verse 13. No, nothing. For she sitteth at the door of her house. That matches the, the, the strange woman over here that, that Solomon talked about. He went the way of her house in the twilight and even the black and the dark of night. Behold, there met him a woman with a tire of a, of a harlot and she and subdued of heart. She is loud and stubborn, and her feet abide not in her house. So this foolish woman is likened to a strange woman of adultery. For she sits at the door of her house on the seat in the high places of the city. She's a councilwoman. She's a mayor. She's a representative. She's a woman with a city of, uh, 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 title. But she ain't telling people about Jesus. She ain't telling people about God. Like Proverbs chapter 1 where wisdom cries out about Jesus Christ. About God. She don't do that. Romans 12, 16. She should be in the house making dinner and making breakfast, taking care of the kids. If she's sitting outside of her door, she's loafing. A woman's work used to be said, used to be, when I grew up, used to be it was never done. And she can find time to sit down. To call the passengers who go right on their ways. That's the woman that we just read. 
she met this guy and she went up to him and said, Oh, I've been looking for you, dear. She also cries out. But not as wisdom cries out for life. We'll see where this woman cries out for. Who is simple? Same one that wisdom that we try to reach. Proverbs 1. She's reaching the same people we try. Let him. See, I've got no here. Uh, let's see. Verse 5 says, Come. Verse 16 says, Let him. That's an invitation. Both the wisdom and the foolish gives man an invitation. Turn in hither. And as for him that want this understanding, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Verse 4, as for him that want this understanding, they're both seeking something to understand. Chapter 20, verse 17. Wisdom says, come eat of my bread and drink of the wine which I... Wisdom brings the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to see what the foolish woman wants? Watch. Stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. There's the bread and there's the water. She's got an imitation of what wisdom gives out. Wisdom's bread and wine is Jesus Christ. The foolish waters, not wine, there's no blood, anemic. And bread represents or shows the pleasure of sin. Isn't stealing water so great and tastes so good? You show me somewhere in the Bible where God, Jesus Christ, and His wisdom encourage you to steal anything. And bread eaten in secret. Why would you eat bread in secret? What are religions? Oh, we got these plagues and they're hidden way back into this, wherever they, they got them hidden. You know, we got these secret handshakes and, and rings and, and flop your head three times, whatever. You can't know until you pass the karma or whatever, car dad or something, I don't know, car go. That's religion. It's stolen. You stole it from the imitation of you taken from Christ. And by the way, verse 17 is a lie. It's not sweet and it's not pleasure. Even though. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11 speaking about Moses to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season I believe it said or a moment I'm not sure you have to go check that how many people enjoy sin in their life are now forever eternally in hell today enjoying it brother enjoying it sister how many Christians today when they stand at the judgment seat of Christ, they're going to walk away with no crowns. But you enjoyed it? Did you have fun doing it? Yeah, you may have enjoyed it and had sweet and pleasure down here, but you ain't going to have it in eternity, saved or lost. But he, the one who wants understanding, who did not go the way of wisdom, knoweth not that the dead are there. Oh, wisdom brings life. This foolish woman brings death. And go back to, to Proverbs chapter 8, last night's study, about life. This is not Jesus Christ. But he knoweth not. That's an agnostic. Agnostic doesn't know. 
So somebody goes, oh, I don't really know, but he knows not. That's you, right? Yeah, that's agnosis. That the dead are there. And if you continue to go the way you go, and that her guess, religion, science, humanity, yes, anybody who's not saved and applies to the wisdom that God has are in the depths of hell. You got one that's a way of life, and you got one that's a way of hell. In verse 18, Matthew 23, 14, and Psalm 86, 13. So we're starting to contrast this, and what are contrast in the whole entire chapter? God's wisdom versus the foolish woman. One giveth life. And one giveth hell. They both have an invitation, and their invitation is both to someone who wants understanding. Every man st starts off the same. He's born of a woman, he needs to be born again. God will give him light, and then where he ventures off the straight path or the broad way. By the way, Broadway has all kinds of lights, but it's not the light of God. Plain and simple.